So takeaways, who wants to start? Oh, oh. Chris, too fast. Okay. Rears the government has forced vehicle segregation upon our communities through poor zoning laws and non-strategic urban planning for housing developments. The results of this became unfavorable for African American communities and we have been trying to clean up our actions ever since. Mm. We've been trying? <coughs> okay. Jared. Although the government can use Section 8 funding and low income tax crediting to try and supply housing, implementation of these systems in the neighborhoods which are currently segregated only further reinforces the idea of economic and racial segregation. So you focused in on a specific thing. Okay. Uh, Bradley. The promotion of economic inequality has created a setback for architectural and economic advancement in the U.S. Okay. Connie. In a time where our nation was growing, many decided to focus on the separation between one another based on minute differences rather than focusing on how to grow a nation and its people as a whole. Okay. Okay. You may open the floodgates, but there's no water behind those doors, and the outcome will be affected by the Tamara. Marika has come on the way to request to drive racial segregation out of the border. Okay. Um, back row, Z. Uh, I said modern social communities are set up in the way that they are predominantly from racial zoning in the past 25 years, reflecting as to why in modern day we have communities that are predominantly black, such as in Boston, we have Dorchester, compared to areas predominantly white, such as Interesting. So you're bringing in your own stuff. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Dan, right. Of course, racial segregation has more of an impact on the race leading to the formation of slums and poverty in the neighborhood and is responsible for how a modern community is shaped. Okay. Uh, Xavier. Modern society is a result of deliberate design and approaches, the creation of structure which dictates uh, better freedom and ability for African Americans to thrive and prosper. The covert design choices um, then. Basically, the built environment is a manifestation of um, the mantra of the people. The people? Who control it? Who control it? Okay. So there's a question, is it a passive outcome or is it an instrumental force driving, reproducing? So think about that. So up here to Will. The zoning practices of the 20th century created racially segregated neighborhoods as a system to oppress African Americans by forcing them into slums and creating an economic divide that continues to prevent their opportunities to expand. Since the end of slavery, racial segregation has existed through zoning in our society, ultimately creating a restriction on the African American community that has continued to live with them today. Okay, Michael. In a time where the government could have spent their time bringing people together, they put their energy towards segregating and separating. Yeah. Jay. Discrimination runs deep in those who are ignorant and stubborn to change. And when people are faced with uncertainty, they become selfish and um, pathetic. Okay. Yeah. In the past, zoning laws were used to suppress the liberty of minorities via segregation. We must be informed citizens and analyze how our laws today affect people from all backgrounds and how they may be used to segregate people. Okay, I'm Jim. Um, I have more of like a portion of like opposition most by the racial conflict. How is the discrimination and the differentiation, differentiation different? Heavily depends on the point of perspective. Mm. Okay, Justin. Governments cannot remain neutral in regards to racial issues because they will intensify and cause bigger problems <coughs> in the future. Okay. And um, given this situation, what what would you like to get out of this lecture? God damn it. Uh, how can how can we like design to break segregation barriers that already exist? Yeah, that's good. Anything else? Does that not cover anything? What can design do to, to shift the situation? Integration. Well, yeah, what's, but what's your question, what's your target question for this lecture? What can design do? 
But is there something more specific? Yeah. Um, thinking about like the lecture on Wednesday, she talked about like longevity and thinking of the future. Yeah. So like I was thinking about how science can kind of like move beyond our time scope to think about like future, what like future problems. Trying to like fix them now. So long, long Jeff. So the long perspective, the long game beyond our lifetimes. Yeah. Uh, like on the scale of nuclear waste, yeah. 10,000 years. What else? <laughs> what else do you need to get? This is your chance to have an impact on the lecture and the education of you and your colleagues. Give me a hard one. I feel like the, um, the patterns that are like the urban, um, how they like segregated and stuff. It, it like boils down to like people, not like architecture. Okay, there's, it, there's a lot of reason to be skeptical about uh, the ability of me and the ability of architecture to have any impact on anything. So that's, I'm taking that for granted. Because I went to school, I had a career as an architect, I have a career as an architect. And the message I received from my teachers and from my education and from my world is we're just architects. We, we just, you know, we can't really have an impact on anything, right? So that's, I'm taking that for granted as the given. And then I'm asking the question, I want us to ask the question collaboratively together between today and Wednesday. Is that really true? Or is there something that we can do and the reason we think, the reason we have a right to think that maybe it's not true, that actually architecture can have an impact, is Medellin, Singapore, the Netherlands, all these examples where architecture uh, wasn't the sole factor, but without architecture, it would not have happened the way it happened. So that's very troubling. And I'm so, uh, I'm like a newborn baby, and I have to ask questions all over again. All my assumptions are out the window. And sorry, but I'm taking you with me. <coughs> Throw your assumptions out the window, and let's figure out if, in fact, we are powerless, which is what the world wants us to think. We have no impact. Okay. It's another question. If you're systematically forced to be poor, then how do you lift yourself out? Right. If, if the structure is such that you kind of have, there's no hope, how do you, how do you break through that? Yeah. Any other questions? I'll ask the same question I asked last time, is how do you change the structure? How do you change the structure? Because I feel like that's another thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So who's skeptical? Who thinks architecture can't really do anything meaningful? Which is reasonable. Who thinks uh, architecture, uh, on a good day, uh, can change things? Um, how likely is it that architecture, now let's be honest, how likely is it? Like, um, well, that's, that's, we'll leave that as an open-ended question. What is it? What is it going to take for, for what we do as architects to have an impact on these big structural forces? And um, when you get out there, I think structure agency would be a great name for a firm. And I think that... Um, And this, so I think this colon, I, I was thinking about it. Structure agency is kind of um, a situation that we read in the world in the history theory sequence of courses. Like it started with the big idea talks in freshman year. And it, then uh, you picked it up in history theory one. You're reading it through the history of architecture. You're reading the operation of structure in a relationship to agency that produces certain outcomes, right? And then in this course and in the other concentration studies courses, 
uh, it's really you're analyzing the situation so that you know what to do as architects. But when you get in the design studio, you this colon becomes something a lot more active. You you do you do your site analysis, right? You do your site analysis. Structure your site is part of the structure. You figure out the situation, right? You like to do dance halls in studio. Everyone does. I was told that your program, by the time you finish the undergraduate program, you're really good at dance schools and theaters. Um, so you, you analyze the structure, and then you, you make choices as architects. The design, the, the design is, in a way, an exercise of architectural agency. And and then you anticipate the outcomes of your design and does it have an impact on the structure. So in a way, in this analysis, um, there is no way for a building not to have an impact on the structure. It is literally a shift in structure. It is literally a new structure. So in this perspective, there's no alternative to architecture having an impact on structure, that's all it does with absolute certainty. It's a restructuring. It's, uh, and now the question is, uh, and it's a little more embarrassing for us as a profession. Now it's a question, do we have the guts to acknowledge, do we have the guts to acknowledge that we have that power? Because the first sign that someone has a lot of power is that they deny their own agency. If someone is telling you, I don't really have any authority, I don't really have any impact on the outcomes, I don't really have any power, that's the person with power. <coughs> so, that's an inter interesting framing of this topic and every topic. Um, but this is, so in a way, the reason we like to teach some of these things is it provides us such a vivid demonstration of the relationship between structure and agency that all of a sudden, once you see it in one situation, all of a sudden you start to see it everywhere. So I'd, I'd like you to, you know how that happens? You, you, you see something and all, and, and all of a sudden you start seeing it everywhere? That is the thing we hope will happen uh, as we look at a very vivid demonstration of the relationship between structure and agency. We hope that you start to see it everywhere. Um, and if your laptop is open but you're not taking notes, please close them. And I will come around at some point to help you with that. Um, so the LA school, let's get right into the LA school. Um, at this point, this is, we're beyond asking, does politics have anything to do with architecture? Uh, I think the relationship between politics and architecture is really a question of structure and agency. Um, and the things that we are doing in the analysis exercises, we are taking fragments of the world and we are, in a way, think of it this way, we are analyzing the formal, we're analyzing forms, the buildings, the spaces between the buildings, and their relationship to institutional arrangements. So it's a formal, spatial, institutional arrangement that we are analyzing in these uh, in these images, and together these establish structures. So if you looked at the Wentworth campus, um, it's the form and the space is not neutral. In order to understand, in order to properly interpret the relationship between these buildings and the quads, you have to understand that this is a, a college, this is a university, and this is a college campus. And that, then and only then can you really interpret uh, the formal spatial arrangements. So it's really, and together the form, the spaces between the forms 
and the institutions, the institutional arrangements that these literal structures are helping to support, now you've got a sense of the structure. And within that structure, like you are, we are all occupants of a formal spatial institutional arrangement that is the Wentworth Institute of Technology. And we have agency. We choose this major. We take these classes, although you don't have much agency there. And you move through the campus. You can decide whether to come to class or not. And there is another structure called the grading system that um, you can engage and uh, make your choices within that structure uh, that yields certain outcomes. That's something that you should all be intimately familiar with. So I've, these slides are somewhere between where they were last year and where I want them to go, so it's a bit of a mess right now. But the thing about Los Angeles is that uh, for the longest time, up until, uh, to including my own education, I, I took a version of this course at MIT in 1996. And at that point, uh, we went through the entire history of cities, uh, starting with Chatal Huyuk in Turkey uh, thousands of years ago. And we came all the way up to, I don't know, Chicago in the post-war period. And then we stopped. Even though it was 1996, it was a history course, so we didn't talk about anything that we've talked about in this course. We stopped at a point when the human population was around 3 billion compared to the current 7.7 .7 billion and peak human uh, expected 11 billion. So none of the stuff that I'm going through in this course was included so far was included in the course that I got. So I, took, I was a student in that course, and then I was a TA in that course twice. And then I co-taught with a professor at MIT uh, the course, the seminar, the graduate seminar that feeds into that course. And I pushed, and I pushed, and I pushed, and I said, listen, man, you've got to teach the LA school. It is so important, and it's established, and we have to teach it. So uh, originally, he and I were going to co-teach a course on the LA school. But he wasn't comfortable with it because he was an old fart and he had power and he cut it down, cut it down, cut it down until the LA school became a half of a lecture in that course. And so this is near and dear to my heart. It's something I feel is so important for all architects to understand. Um, and it starts with the fact that LA, for most of the history of the discipline of architecture, LA was not considered a real city. It wasn't considered worth looking at as a city because it. Uh, we know what cities look like. We're architects. We know what cities look like. Right? They look like New York. They look like Boston. They look like London, Paris, Berlin, Tokyo. Those are real cities. None of this LA stuff. That's an aberration. So for most of the post-war period in the field of architecture, we considered LA to be a non-city, kind of a non-place it's even been called. And it was Rainer Banham, this British architectural uh, theorist and historian, who left the comfort of London and Norwich and moved to LA because he just loved, loved, loved the craziness of LA. He wrote this book called The Architecture of Four Ecologies about Los Angeles. And a weird thing happened. Uh, all of these things that he observed as being characteristic of LA went from being an aberration to becoming the norm. So at the point when I was trying to convince my good friend and colleague at MIT that we should be teaching the LA school, he was saying, nah. But by 1996, uh, no, when we were doing this, it was 99. By 99, uh, it had already very clearly shifted and cities all over the world were uh, 
variations on the LA theme. So the key thing about LA, it is a polynucleic city. There are multiple centers. It's not, it's not a con <coughs> classic. The classic uh, city is characterized by Chicago, and we'll look at this as we move forward. But you have a central place, and the, more, the closer you get to the center, the higher the density, uh, the higher the land values, and the higher the buildings. And that's what's so weird about Dubai. It has nothing to do with that. Um, but Chicago does. And just take um, Lake Michigan out, and you've got, you've got Chicago, which is the birthplace of the concentric city model. And that's, that was, that uh, interpretation of the history of cities was so dominant that it blinded us to the possibility of anything but that. And if LA looks like this in the uh, earliest interpretations, um, the students of this course have gone on and, and made this analysis back when uh, we thought this was permissible. It's not anymore. Um, but looking at <clears throat> the 17 million people of Los Angeles, of what we think of as Los Angeles, Los Angeles is a municipality uh, that's something like this. And Los Angeles is a county of something like this. But Los Angeles, as a greater metropolitan area, really encompasses most of Southern California, and by some interpretations would include San Diego and Tijuana, so crossing an international border, and increasingly going all the way up to Santa Barbara. So it's really an, an immense region uh, 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 it's 137 different uh, towns, and uh, it's if it were a country, it would be the seventh largest economy in the world. And the interesting comparison is uh, it's about, in terms of population, uh, size, and size of economy, it's about the same as the Netherlands. So it's an interesting comparison. Because, as, uh, and we'll carry this forward into next week's topic, um, Los Angeles is ridiculed as not being a city because it's really a collection of suburbs. Each of these towns were set up uh, independently and only uh, with the increasing of uh, driving an automobile infrastructure does it operate as a single economic <coughs> entity. So just let's look at one part of this thing again. Remember this? This is the part where one percent of America has forty percent of all the nation's wealth. At the bottom eighty percent Eight out of every 10 people, or 80 out of these 100, only has 7% between them. And this has only gotten worse in the last 20 to 30 years. While the richest 10% <coughs> take home almost a quarter of the national income today, in 1976, they took home only 9%, meaning their share of income has nearly tripled in the last 30 years. So the thing this was looking at is wealth. It's wealth inequality. What's the other thing other than wealth? What do we pay taxes on? Do we pay taxes on our wealth? Property. Yeah, uh, the wealth embedded in property. We do pay property taxes. That's income. interesting. Income. So there is wealth and there is income. So I can have $100 billion and I can have it in a non-interest bearing account, and I don't pay a penny of taxes on that. If it's in a non-interest bearing account, I just have it, and I don't have to give the government a penny of that. The income is what I pay taxes on. And so there's income tax. How much is income tax? 
30, about, yeah, a rule of thumb. If, if someone's offering you a job, and I'm gonna, no one's going to do this for a few years now. But if someone offers you a job at $100,000 a year, and you need to quickly do the math in your head, how much are you going to take home? 70 grand. <laughs> but I like your confidence. Well, you are probably deducting your uh, retirement contributions yeah. as well. So that was actually a more sophisticated answer than I was looking for. Um, so, uh, and how much, uh, how big of a house can you afford? How um, well, forget, uh, take out the word big then. That was, that was the right response. How much can you afford to pay for a house if you are taking home $70,000 a year after taxes? Now how much money can you spend on a house if you could get one at that price? Do you have money already for like a down payment? No. Like, no. No. You probably should get a house. Well, uh, <laughs> there are first time, first time buyer uh, discounts where depending on the town, uh, you might only have to pay zero down. But five and 10%, a lot of towns have five and 10% uh, down payment. The standard down payment nowadays is 20%. But if you're a first time uh, buyer, it's almost always half that. And in some places, it's less than that. So now, so what's the rule of thumb? How much, how much can, if, let's say you're graduating and you're getting a job offer at, what do you guys say? What, what were you gonna answer? No, I was just gonna go off. Go ahead, go ahead, go off. Um, I mean, realistically, most people would not want to spend, you know, more than 30% of their total income on, say, rent or anything on a mortgage for a three-year mortgage. So you hear that? I'm personally comfortable with 50% because that's the only thing I'm going to actually be able to afford. 50 to 60%. <coughs> so that's the answer I was looking for. Let's look at this briefly. Um, this uh, this is another way of looking at the things we're talking about in this course that um, in the post-war period during the Great Acceleration, uh, this is the percentage increase in real income during the Great Acceleration, and this is huge. This is a steady uh, income uh, increase in income up until um, the late 60s, early 70s, and then something weird happens. Uh, productivity keeps going up. Productivity is a technical term for what are the total values of goods and services and bads and disservices because we don't distinguish between bads and goods. We don't distinguish between services and disservices, right? So if we're paying money for death and destruction, that is a positive gain as measured by the economic system. So I just want you to note that. <clears throat> so the total value of goods and bads, services and disservices, that total amount uh, that uh, is produced by, this, by X number of workers, that is considered the productivity or the destructivity. Uh, but technically, you cannot, economists call it the productivity. So the productivity of the US economy keeps going up and up and up. Computers, thank you, up and up. The productivity keeps going up, but that doesn't show up on the income of most people. As a matter of fact, the real uh, purchasing power of a majority of Americans has gone down as the productivity goes up because the wealth that is being created is being concentrated at the top. Thus, the graph, this graph is a product of that concentration the top of productivity uh, by the top. Here's a film. My name is Mr. Reich. I'm the Secretary of Labor under Bill Clinton. Before that, the Carter administration. Before that, I was a special aide to Abraham Lincoln. He's teaching a course at Berkeley. The United States has the most unequal distribution of income, and we're surging toward even greater inequality. 
1928 and 2007 become the peak years for income concentration. It looks like a suspension bridge. Last year we made 36,000. I could probably make 50,000 a year working 70 hours a week. The middle class is struggling. When people occasionally say to me, what nation does it better? The answer is the United States. In the decades after World War II, the economy boomed, but you had very low inequality. Do you know Robert Reich? I do, and he's a communist. When I was a kid, bigger boys would pick on them. I think it changed my life. I had to protect people from the people who would beat them up economically. Who is actually looking out for the American worker? The answer is nobody. Workers don't have power if they don't have a voice. Their wages and benefits start eroding. We are losing equal opportunity in America. Any one of you who feels cynical, just consider where we have been. So this came out several years ago. Um, it's not really current, but he has uh, a YouTube channel where he's updating it constantly. But the question for us, I mean, so this is all out there. You know, uh, if you haven't been looking at it, you could, you should. Uh, but the question for us is, what's the architecture part of this story? This is a huge structural complex. And uh, architecture is at the heart of it, as implied by the reading. Um, and so let's look at that uh, architecture at the heart of it. So this is something I'm not going to go into uh, because we're going to go into it as we move back in time and we look at Chicago. Um, but this is the classic Chicago um, analysis of where people live and where value accumulates. The highest values per square foot in the center and then going out until you reach agricultural value at the periphery. So from $1 a square foot to $1,000 a square foot you know, and everything in between. So it's, a, it's an exponential increase as you increase in density. And this is what we thought, this is how cities work. It's, it's just, that's how all cities work throughout human history. Um, but uh, not so much because Los Angeles has disrupted that. Uh, there are other forces at work that disturb the smoothness of the logic of this, these circles. And my other favorite professor at MIT to um, ridicule is William Wheaton, who is a giant, a pioneer of urban economics. And he is so stuck on this that as recently as last year in a public forum, he was, it was talking about housing affordability and the crisis of housing affordability, and he was still stuck on this, saying, well, you can't argue with uh, the concentric model of uh, housing value, except you can. You actually, it's, it's so rare to find anything but local instances of that still operating because of these other forces uh, in architecture that uh, we're looking at. So let's go back to Jakarta. There are zones and barriers. There are zones of high luxury. Um, and you can tell by the open space. It used to be this red stuff all the way across. But because of the legal title to these, these lands is not uh, so clear, uh, that makes them vulnerable to corrupt uh, developers in cooperation with government officials to uh, dispossess them of that land. So to make um, a highway, big road architectural uh, uh, intervention. And I call this big road architecture because there's a big road and then the predictable iconic corporate buildings that pop up on either side and then maybe in a later development some luxury housing back here and maybe a golf course in the future when they take care of, of that. And so you get this enclave, <coughs> this enclave formation of cities that is what we read about last week. Um, there are, this is a simpler model where you have zoning segregation of commercial, 
uh, downtown uses, and then at some distance you have residential districts. And the, in, that, in the former concentric model, you have slums and things between the uh, luxury downtown and the luxury residential single family districts. But in the new model, in the Los Angeles school, this is the LA school model that we see in Jakarta and Bangkok and Shanghai and every, you name it, pretty much every city uh, outside of any city that's been growing significantly in the last um, few decades. This is the new pattern, this is the new paradigm. This is the new structural formation that is transforming cities around the world. And it has, uh, you go from your gated, uh, your gated residential luxury enclave to your gated uh, work and recreation, shopping, restaurants, entertainment district. And um, what is connecting these two things? Highways. Highways. So you leave your, your luxury glass house, glass and steel and concrete house, and you get into your luxury glass and steel and rubber and petroleum portable living room with your quadraphonic sound system, your air conditioning, and your tinted windows, and you endure whatever you have to endure uh, in terms of traffic to get to your luxury entertainment slash work zone, and then you repeat that day in, day out. And that is the model. Um, and um, very quickly, the part that we did not look at in, in close up is what's happening in these speckled spots? What is that? Public space. Is it public space? What did Rem Kohlhaas, do you guys, I, I'm always <coughs> confused. Do you guys know who Rem Kohlhaas is? Rem Kohlhaas? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I have a speech impediment from speaking Dutch, so I have to say it properly. I apologize. I but um, so Rem Kohlhaas uh, called this junk space. It's that leftover space that you have to get through to get from your luxury thing point A to your luxury point B. And the, the, the walls around your luxury point A and the walls around your luxury point B uh, and the highways has a way of taking two neighbors, maybe uh, the aunt and the, uh, the grandmother and the cousins, and they create barriers where people used to be able to get to work and jobs and relationships and social opportunities. Um, these enclaves create barriers, and this is what that looks like. So this is one of the luxury enclaves of uh, Jakarta, and this is what the boundary looks like. This is the architecture of the edge, and it has a way of creating barriers between communities that used to be uh, connected. And then even within those communities, they like to create barriers just in case the, the guard posts are breached, as did happen in 1998 after I took this photo. <clears throat> so back to the housing thing. As these luxury enclaves are constructed, they tend to inflate the housing costs outside of the, the enclaves. And so um, <clears throat> the rule of thumb, if you're asking me, the bank, for a mortgage, right? we're back to the scenario where you've graduated. This is practical knowledge for your near future. Um, as a banker, I'll give you a I'll give you a mortgage. I'll, I'll, un, I'll underwrite your mortgage if you earn enough money <coughs> to cover the housing costs. 
And so I'll say um, welcome, uh, Mr. Mr. Picarello. How do you say your name? Picarello. Picarello. Good morning, Mr. Picarello. How much do you make? Sorry to ask you a personal question, but I'm a bank. No, you make sixty thousand dollars. Right? So you make sixty thousand. Oh my God! He's straight and say. So how much is that a month? Five. Okay. And how much is your take-home pay after taxes? <clears throat> you don't take that home. Twenty-five hundred. Well, that's if you're making maximum contributions to your retirement account. So let's say yes. Thank you for being responsible. Let's say 2400 for the map. Okay. So uh, how much can Mr. Piccarello afford to contribute to his monthly housing costs? I, I did a, a 24, so it'd be easier to. 800. So you, you're, the, mark, the housing costs that Mr. Piccarello can afford uh, is 800 a month. I'm sorry. <laughs> So now what? How much? How much of a house can you buy for that? Two hundred eighty-eight thousand. You buy a van and live in it. Two hundred eighty-eight thousand dollars. You have thirty-year mortgage. You have oh, thank you so much. That, where did you look that up? My uh, calculator. So. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. So you didn't use the amortization. No. So it's probably probably more than that. When you put in the like, interest rates and things like that. Well, here's the thing. By the time you finish, by the time Mr. Picarello finishes paying off his house, uh, he will have paid roughly twice as much as the purchase price of the house. Often more. Mm -hmm. If it's a 30-year mortgage, current rates are pretty low. I think you can get 3.125 historically. That is a very low percentage rate. Woohoo! Time to buy, right? Except for the housing bubble thing. Uh, which may or may not burst. So it's it's hard to purchase um, an appropriate house. Um, so let's just cut that number in half. So one hundred and forty thousand dollar house. So the. But then there's the, as a banker, uh, is the, if this is a condo, there are condo association costs, and that's going to be four hundred a month. Yeah, it's going to be three or four hundred a month. Uh, there's not much left over. So, so what are you guys going to do when you get to this point? You know this thing where you um, decided to sock it away for retirement. Historically. What uh, the generations that come before you, what they have decided to do, is not save for retirement. Not a good, not a good choice. But, but when push comes to shove, this is also one person though, too, right? So say, you, say you had, say you had a spouse, and they yeah. were also bringing salary, then right, this would all help. Right, that helps. Right. But, but do you see what you're up against? So I'm, I'm under the influence of that rap song that we saw. I think this is actually something you should know about. Right? This is an important part of your education. So this is something to think about. It's also part of the reading. Um, OK, who wants to get a mortgage? OK, no, uh, no, 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 no. Is anyone Italian? No, no. Anyone Irish? Irish? No, no, no. Okay, who's left? Me and Chris. So, 
<laughs> so it used to be yeah. it used to be all of these segregation, all of these all of these racial categories. Um, okay, uh, African Americans were enslaved, right? We get that, but then there's immigrants. You know who else used to be not enslaved but were considered black? The Irish. The Irish. You know who else? The Italians. It took a lot of work for the Italians to become white. It took a lot of work for the Irish to become white. Um, it's a weird thing. Um, so it's really hard to pay for a house. It's really hard to afford a house. Good luck to all of you. It's getting harder and harder. It used to be, the rule of thumb was, if you made $60,000, you could probably buy a house worth $60,000. Uh, but that has changed, and increasingly, um, you know, it's just um, the, the relationship between median income and median house price. So that's not this, this is house price. Well, I still need to get this data right. But basically, uh, if this is the median house price in the United States, some cities, it's extremely inflated. Um, it used to be that the median income and the median house price tracked. So for most of uh, US history, median house price, during the Great Acceleration since World War II, median house price and median income tracked very evenly because it makes sense. You can't sell houses for more than people can buy them for. Right? Makes sense. So what's going on here? All of a sudden, median house prices uh, after the 70s are two, three, four times uh, the median income. Who's buying these houses? Who's distorting the median house price up beyond any historically predictable level? So I don't know, but uh, the first place I would look is uh, the investment, uh, the, the influence of exchange value on the actual sales history. Olivia. Right. This is where, um, very early in the semester, I said, see that third tower in Boston? Um, it's not a prudential life insurance company. It's not the John, Hanco John Hancock insurance company. It's not even an insurance company. It's not even a company. It's a condominium. It's a luxury condominium tower. And uh, no one lives there yet. It's not finished. But keep an eye on it. I predict that when it's finished and when it is entirely sold out, it will remain dark. Uh, beyond, it will be darker than the residential properties around it. And the higher on the tower you go, the more darkness you will find. Because the more expensive the real estate, the less likely it is that someone lives there. Because it's an investment property, it's, an enti it's the architecture of exchange value and financialization of the world. It is not the architecture of people needing and using space. And it is something that is uh, a major suspect in the crime uh, mystery of uh, what's going on with real estate prices. So let's get to the reading. <coughs> The background, so uh, this book, how many of you have heard of this book before? <coughs> Great. Where did you hear of it? Xavier. Did I mention it? Xavier. Xavier? Xavier's all over this book. He mentioned it to me last summer. Where did you guys hear of it? Um, you mentioned it in history 
I did? Yeah, it's awesome. Oh, wow. It's like, who? Who's that good? <laughs> um, so it's a very important book. There is a chance. This book actually gave some of us some hope that actually the US government might actually change its attitude. So the background for the book is that um, uh, the Supreme Court has ruled housing segregation was not the product of legal arrangements. Housing segregation was the product, was the result of personal choice. People live in segregated enclaves because they want to live in segregated enclaves. Thus saith the Supreme Court of the United States. Thus absolving the US government and the US people from addressing any uh, consequences. There's nothing to correct because segregation is over. Hooray, we had a black president, hooray. And this book actually reopens that question in a very serious way by saying, sure, there was no, there, the, a long time ago, we stopped, uh, we, we repealed any law that said, yes, you can uh, refuse to rent or sell a house based on race. That law changed in the 1960s during my lifetime, by the way. So not that long ago. I'm not that old. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so we're good now. There's nothing else to be done. But there's something weird going on because the outcomes, if you, if you look at the world in terms of structure, agency, and the outcomes that they produce, the housing in the United States is more segregated today than it was in the 60s. The schools of the United States are more segregated today than they were in the 1960s. The income discrepancies keep getting greater and greater and greater. And as great as the income discrepancies are, the wealth discrepancies, remember there's a difference between wealth and income, the wealth discrepancies are even more dramatic to the point where the median uh, African American household wealth accumulated is about one sixth of the median uh, household wealth of uh, uh, a non African American household in the United States. And the lion's share of that wealth discrepancy is traceable back to housing and uh, neighborhoods and thus architecture. So this is a really interesting point of, of entry. It's so exciting that you, when you have the chance to face these huge, epic, historic uh, struggles and injustices, and you find actually at the core of the issue, architecture. So in response to the uh, target question for the lecture, what does architecture have to do with any of this? Can architects make a change? Uh, here's a clue. There's a hint that yes, architecture is actually the biggest single contributor to the wealth, to the wealth gap uh, and the design of towns and cities and the institutional arrangements of towns and cities is the biggest uh, factor in determining the outcomes of educational discrepancies. So the background of this color of law reading is uh, that we didn't uh, have in the reading itself was the first civil rights legislation in the United States was not, in, it was in the 60s, but it wasn't in the 1960s, it was in the 1860s. Isn't that weird? The first civil rights legislation that granted equal rights to all Americans was not in the, it was in the 60s, but not the 1960s, it was in the 1860s. Well, uh, it wasn't just the Emancipation Proclamation, there were a whole series of laws that made it illegal to discriminate. Xavier? Is that? 
You're just stretching? Um, there was a period uh, from the end of world, uh, the Civil War uh, in 1865 uh, until 1877 uh, in which um, uh, former slaves were given the right to vote, former slaves were given the right to property, uh, former slaves uh, were elected. We had uh, the first black governor in the United States was in Louisiana in 1872. The second black governor in the United States waited, had to wait another century because something happened in 1877. Um, well, first, something happened at the end of Civil War. Um, the former slaves who were fighting with the North, with the Union, were told that um, when, when the um, when, when the North wins the war, we will confiscate the lands of the white plantation owners, and every, every black citizen, every former slave, will get 40 acres of land uh, to own. That was the deal, 40 acres. And that's uh, one of the subsections. Remember, we talked, we talked about the Jeffersonian grid in that other class? the Jeffersonian grid that was stretched across the United States. Well, if you subdivide the townships, the six-mile townships, six by six, and then if you keep subdividing, you eventually get down to a 40-acre plot of land, which was a standard measure of agricultural land. So that was the promise to uh, all former slaves. Um, sorry about the slavery thing. Here's some land. Um, but. Unfortunately, in Ford Theater in 1865, uh, Abraham Lincoln was shot, and the vice president uh, was a white supremacist from the South, and he uh, established, he, uh, he helped establish a return of white supremacy in the government structure throughout the South, and so uh, the former plantation owners were granted their land back after the Civil War. It was not confiscated uh, and it was not redistributed. However, uh, very quickly, and it was weird back then, the South was democratically controlled, uh, white supremacist Democratic Party, and the Republican Party was the party of uh, the North, the party of uh, freeing the slaves, the party of Lincoln. It's this glorious past of the Republican Party that is mentioned often. Um, uh, but something happened that we're not going to go into. Um, but so uh, basically what happened is instead of being given 40 acres to own, the system of sharecropping was established. In the sharecropping system, um, uh, we allow you to live in these ramshackle shacks, uh, and we allow you to plant uh, what we tell you that you need to plant. We will sell you the seed. We will sell you the tools. We will rent you the house. We will, uh, we will uh, repair the fence and charge you for that. And you can plant the crop we tell you to plant, cotton often, and you get to keep two-thirds of what we say we will pay you for that cotton uh, as long as you give us one-third. Um, and this system, the way I described it, um, you can tell what happened. is actually the cost of the fence, the cost of the tools, the cost of the seed, the cost of all these things added up to more than the price the landowners set for the cotton. And so it locked, uh, for 100 years, this was the Jim Crow South, um, where it locked uh, the sharecropping uh, population into conditions that were not slavery. It was capitalism, in a way, of a sort. And it wasn't just former slaves locked in sharecropping. There were a lot of impoverished uh, white um, sharecroppers, uh, recent immigrants, 
Uh, and so there was an entire class of sharecroppers locked in this uh, indentured servitude that in some ways was worse than slavery because the incentive for the slave owners to maintain a healthy workforce uh, was not there. Um, there's that graph. So fast forward. So that's the background to the reading. Did you? No. Keep. Um, so that's the background to the reading. Uh, the chapters that came before chapter three, uh, and then, but the main takeaway of chapter three has to do with the tools of architecture and urban planning that were established um, for the purposes of uh, segregating the populations of the United States. And this was true in the North and the South. There were things called the Black Codes that uh, were established during slavery and the Black Codes during the Jim Crow period after 1877. <laughs> well, what happened in 1877? Um, there, the, re the Republican controlled government uh, for the first time in US history uh, overrode the vetoes of the white supremacist president and they established civil rights. And so this period between uh, 1865 and 1877 is the period of reconstruction. And there was a re-establishment of citizen rights, uh, a construction of citizen rights for all Americans, including the former slaves. But in, 19, in 1877, the Republican Party was, have, was in a dead heat in the presidential election. This is going to sound familiar. So they weren't that good at counting votes, apparently, and it was so close that they sent it to the Electoral College. The Electoral College was so close, they sent it to a committee, and the committee um, was so deadlocked that they made a deal. The Republican Party of the North said, hey guys, you Democratic white supremacists of the South, if you allow Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican from the North, to be president, we will remove the United States armed forces that were enforcing uh, the, the laws of the United States in the former uh, Confederate states. We'll remove those, those armed forces. And they jumped at that opportunity. So Rutherford, in this deal, Rutherford B. Hayes became president of the United States. And in exchange, um, the conditions of slavery were reinstated uh, throughout the South and uh, increasingly throughout the country. And so those were the Jim Crow years. The Jim Crow laws. Uh, basically took the black codes of the slavery period and removed the word slave and inserted the word Negro. And that was the only change. And th those black codes were then embraced by South Africa in the 20th century in the establishment of the grand apartheid system uh, that you may have heard of, of South Africa, where uh, and it's almost word for word. It was true in Grand Apartheid South Africa. It was true in the United States that in order to move through public space, uh, an African American had to have a written permission from an employer giving that person permission to move through space. Is that? Um, and so it. It was the past laws of South Africa had their roots in the past laws of the United States. And so fast forward, now the rest, uh, when we get to the uh, 20th century, you, you see the history, the ruling of Buchanan, that uh, you can't uh, discriminate against um, uh, non-white uh, renters and owners. Uh, was the ruling of the Supreme Court 
early in the century and the rest of the century up until the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Uh, it was a history covered by this reading of manipulating and ducking and uh, allowing, creating structures that had the desired outcomes without stating explicitly the purpose of those structures so that segregation was the unintended consequence it allowed it possible for the Supreme Court and the other courts to rule that segregation outcomes were the unintended consequence of laws that were intended to do other things. And so that was the game. And so this is not just, uh, and so it's a very vivid moment in history where we see the manipulation of structures to produce outcomes uh, and uh, evade the law. The other things, uh, and so questions about that? Because I'm, I'm going to move on beyond what the reading covers. And a lot of this uh, will be covered in future weeks, especially this one. Next week's topic is uh, the impact of uh, the automobile on the American landscape. Uh, and in a way, that is something that cuts through all of these things. Uh, because the, the presence of road infrastructures uh, are so central to the American dream overseas, the LA school, uh, and all of these factors. It's, it's just a huge part of it. So, um, so to, taken together, the Interstate Highway Act, the mortgage, uh, the mortgage subsidy um, that makes it possible to leave <coughs> the cities in large numbers as long as you are white. You can leave the cities and it costs less to live in the new suburbs with good schools than it costs to stay in the cities with decaying housing, bad schools. And so there's a concentration of, of uh, <coughs> hardship in the cities. And really, this is the story, uh, the biggest force in the 20th century is the decline of cities. The biggest force in the urban history of the 20th century in the United States is this dramatic decline of cities uh, before and after World War II uh, with white flight and with the abandonment of inner cities. And the city of Boston uh, still uh, has not recovered, may never recover, from this devastating impacts of uh, the white flight. Um, the school systems uh, are, are um, defunded because in the United States, unlike every other country in the world, schools are locally funded. Every other country in the world, uh, there is a, a, a larger national or at least provincial system where schools are funded uh, to, in a way that evens out the access to good schools uh, across the entire population. In the United States, we do that with electrical service and mail service. Uh, if you live in a highly populated city, it costs you 50 cents to send a letter. If you live in Alaska and someone has to fly a plane to get the letter to you, it still costs 50 cents to send that letter. And in the uh, 1930s, uh, the rural electrification, the principle of government around electricity provision was we want every US citizen to have access to electricity. So we are going to run wires to your house no matter where you live. It might cost next to nothing to run wires to your apartment in a large complex because we're already running it to the other several hundred people in that complex. But if you live out in a farm in Iowa, 30 miles away from the nearest town, we're gonna run wires all the way across the 30 miles of expanse to make sure you get the same cheap electricity that someone in the apartment is getting. 
So it's a very strange discrepancy between the provision of services uh, in one hand and the provision of schools. And this is still something, and so the way I started, uh, one of the things that started this lecture was the fact that schools today are more segregated than they have ever been since the passage of the civil rights legislation in the 1960s that was supposed to end school segregation. And the discrepancy between the expenditure per child, per child, the discrepancy between test scores has never been greater. The achievement gap just keeps widening and widening. And so in the later chapters in this The Color of Law book, there's a discussion of, um, and I'm sorry it's not, it's part of chapter 11. I don't think you guys read it, but they talk about um, the five quintiles the five quintiles of income. So uh, if you break the 100 people on the income inequality, uh, wealth inequality graph, and you have 20 people at the bottom, the bottom 20%, the second quintile is from 20 to 40%, the middle quintile of 40 to 60%, and it's interesting, Rothstein calls that middle quintile, he calls it the middle class. So when he's talking about the middle class, He's talking about the 40 to 60% middle 20% of the income spectrum of the 100 people in that representation. Um, and if we had uh, equal opportunity, right, the myth of the United States is that if you um, work hard and you're smart and you apply yourself, but mostly if you work hard, you can do anything. Right? Who's with me? All right. Well, it's a story. It's a story we've been telling. It's the Horatio Alger story. Uh, does that ring a bell, Horatio Alger? Horatio Alger was a it was a story in the 19th century. A kid who arrived on the docks in New York from the Statue of Liberty, immigrated from some white country in Europe, arrives with a dollar in his his pocket, but by golly, he's going to work. He's going to pull himself up by his bootstraps. And he becomes uh, he, a great success. And he's the embodiment of the American dream. Through hard work and focus, you can do anything. Is that true? Isn't it more so like you have the chance to pursue the opportunity equally? It's not so much that you, if you work, you will get this. It's have the option to work and get that. Well, here, now this gets back to what we were talking about, about the welfare queen. Um, yes, it is absolutely true. Here's a story, a true story of someone who did that. They arrived with zero, and now they're a multi-billionaire. Right? So it's true. End of story. If you listen to Fox News, that's the end of the story. One person did it, that's all we need. Right? Um, but we're, we're not ideological. We're trying to be professional. We have, this is a preview of what you're going to get in professional practice uh, if you take it next year, because I think it's going to be an option for seniors. In professional practice, we, we talk about the ethical obligations of architecture as a profession. And our ethical obligation requires us to look at the data. And so the data shows this, that, uh, and this is what, um, so let me turn on the lights <clears throat> and just do this graph, because I don't trust my slides to have what I needed. Um, if we look at the quintiles, yeah. did you write this down? So if we look at the quintiles, we have the lower 20%, the middle, and then the high. Okay? So these are the first, second, third. Can I use the word quintile now that we've? Mm -hmm. So let's, let's say, so the poorest, 
if there were, uh, there, it is possible to measure social mobility. In a perfect uh, situation, people uh, who are capable of hard work and uh, are smart, that should distribute more or less evenly. So um, if your parents uh, are in the first quintile, um, but uh, you have access to good schools and opportunities in a society with equal opportunity, and there are examples of this, then if, let's say this is 100 people, and here's the bottom 20. The bottom 20 people, four people will stay in the bottom quintile. Four people will end up in the second quintile. Four people will end up in the third quintile. Four people, etc. Does that make sense? Is that a fair? And similarly, in the top quintile, Four people will end up there, four people will end up there, four here, four there. That would be a demonstration of absolute equal opportunity for all. Has never happened, will never happen. There are too many other things, right? So I'm not saying that this is ne even necessarily a goal. Go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, like, especially going from like, the fifth quintile to the first would never happen because we have the whole like the rich get richer and the poor get poorer because of the way that like the zoning and everything's happening. Well yeah. So there are structures, another way of saying this, there are structures that either there are structural arrangements that either make this more so or less so. So we have bankruptcy. So uh, Donald Trump can go bank he can inherit these businesses and one after another they go bankrupt. But he's protected by bankruptcy laws that protect him from being absolutely wiped out. Right? So bankruptcy laws are part of the structure that reduces the chances that the top quintile is going to end up totally impoverished. Um, so, so, but this is a way to measure the degree to which the Horatio Alger story is true throughout time. And we have the records. We have the records, and uh, Rothstein refers to them in <coughs> chapter 11. Um, I'm, I'm not able to reproduce them uh, off the top of my head, but the, the historic data on this demonstrates that uh, the, great, the, mo the time of greatest mobility is exactly the time period identified by Robert Reich in the Great Acceleration. Uh, between 1945, the end of World War II, and the early 1970s. This was the time of decreasing income inequality and the greatest likelihood that hard work can get you ahead. Since that time, the mobility, the social mobility, uh, has been going down and down and down. And if we, uh, and it's, it has not been as low as it is now for a long, long time. And guess what happens if you look at uh, racial groupings on that? The social mobility, the ability to move from one group to another, has decreased uh, the greatest for non-white Americans. So that's, that data is kind of interesting. There are structures like bankruptcy laws, uh, but these structures that we're interested in are these structures. So this is the city of Boston. These, this is the actual redlining map referred to in the book, um, in the reading, where the US government banking regulations uh, made it illegal for uh, federal Housing Authority loan, uh, backed loans that made it illegal for a bank to lend money for a property in a red zone. Uh, you could go to jail. Um, so this is zone four, fourth grade. Uh, the yellow is third grade. Uh, the blue is second grade and the green is first grade. So 
Do you recognize the neighborhoods? Mm -hmm. What do the grades stand for? The grade, these are commercial, yeah. and so non-housing. Like what does the first grade mean? First grade means um, a safe investment. And the way they established these, uh, these zones, as covered in the reading, uh, was they hired real estate brokers to uh, drive through the neighborhoods and establish uh, the racial profile. And to be first grade, it has to be white, and it has to be non-adjacent to an African-American neighborhood. Because adjacency was a mark against you. So uh, in order to qualify as a first grade neighborhood, you have to not be adjacent to neighborhoods with any black residents. And so you always have to have a buffer uh, of either a second grade neighborhood or a large piece of infrastructure. And so we're gonna talk about this uh, next week but uh, according to these maps, you can identify where are you going to build your infrastructure. You build your infrastructure in locations where you can, the first, uh, the first thing you want to do is you want to uh, tear down the houses of non-white neighborhoods. So you want to definitely run something through here. Um, the second thing is you want to create a buffer. A freeway is actually uh, considered under these rules a buffer because it creates a zone of no residential, it creates a barrier. So uh, first rule is tear down non-white residents' homes. Second rule is create a buffer zone. So you put it, you target the edges, like this is a good place. <coughs> And I'm not sure, this is, could be a little experiment. You know, build infrastructure here. Does that make sense? That's in, uh, I don't know if uh, Wentworth ever had a planning education, but in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, this same chart would have been used for this same exercise. But at that point, it was to train uh, officials on where to put the freeways. Xavier. Um, so since this is a map of Boston, <coughs> if you look at the red zone that you were going through in, mm -hmm. the border line with the yellow zone on top is actually the green line where the green line is. As far as like on, like on right here? Yeah, that's actually the where the green line runs. Okay. So that was like a little piece of like infrastructure mm -hmm. that separated like the red line of community higher grade. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and then in that other zone, um, down below the red zone that you drew on, uh -huh. that black line is actually where the highway goes that brings you. Okay. So that's I-95? Yeah, that's I-95. Or 93? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's Wentworth. Now what has happened historically? This is a map uh, that has been produced um, So red is, uh, stands for white. So this is a, a racial, um, this is the racial uh, distribution of, of population for Boston. So this entire formerly red zone area has been uh, flipped. Well, this part has been flipped from black to, it was a red zone, but it got flipped uh, I think to white, yeah. It's basically a lot of them are separated through major road arteries, um, boulevards, train tracks. And Franklin uh, Park. Franklin Park, yeah. So um, if you notice, building off the zero with the green line, um, in that map where it was red zone and Oxford, um, where the current green line E train ends is E Street, but it went down to Arbor Way. So when it makes that weird corner right there, uh -huh. that would actually was the old path of the Green Line E train down the Arbor Way at Forest Hills, mm -hmm. which would meet near the old Washington Street Orange Line end. Um, and so the Orange Line has evolved 
Washington Street, and that was another border of the red zone mm -hmm. in Roxbury. Cool. So, <laughs> you were going to say the same thing? <clears throat> so, um, now the job is up to you. What's the architecture of this? So, Xavier, last year you wanted to do an analysis of this, and you were starting to look at Mass Ave as a edge of a red line. Um, so this is actually a really good uh, basis for doing research between now and Wednesday. Uh, where, so I'll put these slides up and you can look for those edges. And what does it look like architecturally? Can you read it in the fabric of Boston today? Olivia. I was gonna ask you, for our videos this week, since we're focusing on zoning, would it be acceptable for us to do a plan view? Because I know you said you're, you prefer like the So um, I'm tempted to encourage you to do whatever seems right, but I'm not going to. I'm going to, I'm going to guide you and, and say we're going to stick with the plan. I'm going to say this. Use the plan view. Use your 20 seconds. Some of you are not taking advantage of your 20 second rule. What's the 20 second rule? Show no picture. Yeah. So uh, in a 60 second video, <clears throat> I think it still says 40 seconds of that time needs to be the focus on the analysis, the image that you are analyzing. It needs to have architectural scale human experience in the foreground set in the context of a larger urban pattern and the relationship between the urban pattern and the architectural experience is where, where we learn stuff. This is where architecture does what it does. This is where the world teaches us how architecture operates. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just stick with that. Given that uh, you have 20 seconds, I encourage you to use that 20 seconds of uh, real estate, of time, to show us the plan view. Show us the planning impact. Your careers, your entire careers, uh, you will be dealing with zoning. Uh, the more I learn about zoning, I've always hated zoning just as an architect, uh, but I hate it even more now as I learn that it wasn't just an unintended consequence, but racial segregation was the cause, was the root of zoning. Racial segregation is the foundation of urban planning in the United States. And uh, we try, we go to town council meetings, we try to change the zoning laws, we try to eliminate the zoning laws because we know that they are doing more harm than good. We don't have a lot of uh, polluting industries that are encroaching on our beautiful residential tree-lined streets. We don't have that problem. Uh, we sent all the polluting industries uh, off to China where they're now being uh, legislated out of existence because they are serious about the climate change rules uh, increasingly. Uh, the only polluting industry we now have are the cars we use to drive around in. And they're crushing small children and people in the crosswalks. And they're spewing uh, toxic chemicals into the air. Um, and so that, so there's no point in the zoning laws anymore. But the only thing we seem to be able to do uh, in this world with zoning is to pass another layer of zoning. So we put another layer of zoning on top of the historic layering of zoning. and then. The new layer of zoning says mixed use. You can do anything you want here. And sometimes we say housing uh, doesn't even count against your FAR, your floor area ratio. So yes, so back to Olivia's question, yes, use the zoning map in your 20 seconds. Use the plan view in the 20 seconds. But then show us the architecture. 
Uh, this is all abstraction. Um, you know, this is Los Angeles. This is all abstraction. We want to see what's the architecture of this. What is the architecture of this level of segregation? This is uh, the concentration of African American population, Asian population, and then the white population. What's going on here? Yellow is Hispanic. What's going on here? What is this line? What do you think that line is? Uh, no. No. It's the boundary between Detroit, the city of Detroit, and the wealthy white suburbs. What's in between that? Um, Is it no, like, I think there's like a no-go zone. Here's the infrastructure. <laughs> no, basically a demilitarized zone. So what's going on here with the re revitalization of Detroit? It's all mixed. It's pretty interesting. A um, few more of these. New York City compared to Boston. There, there's a mathematical uh, formula that says this is 79.1 uh, level of segregation. Anything over 60 is considered extremely s segregated. So 79.1 in New York, Boston, woohoo, 67.8. I have a question, like a personal opinion for you. Do you think that if renting an apartment or leasing an apartment would give like individuals equity, do you think it would raise or diverse the segregation slightly? Well, um, this is a complicated question. Renting doesn't change equity. Oh, uh, you mean, oh, yeah, you mean so equality. You, were, you mean yeah. like uh, equality. Like it, yeah. Like if you were to gain something from renting an apartment, whereas like <coughs> if you own a house, you actually gain like assets. I think he means like legit equity. So if you're paying yeah. rent, you like now own a percentage of the place you're renting out as opposed to just paying rent. Yeah, I think I mentioned this before. In other countries, there are uh, rights to use property. And there's like 34 different levels of rights. Uh, in the United States, we have three. We have fee simple ownership. We have condominium ownership, and we have rental. That's it. It's very simple, very clean, makes it easier uh, in a lot of ways. But there is no equity, there's no asset value to your rental contract. It does not. The reason you should rent and not buy is as if you can rent, if you can decrease your housing costs uh, by renting, and you can put away money little by little and then have enough for a down payment and buy something that you wouldn't otherwise be able to buy. So during, especially if the bubble's about to break, uh, don't buy anything, just rent. Like if you, if you look at the housing prices and you say, well, it can't keep going up, then just rent. Let the real estate bubble burst and then buy. Okay. So what's the architecture of this segregation? Uh, the LA school talks about what happened in LA. The, Frank Gehry is the quintessential architect of, of uh, the fortification. These buildings that he designs, and you see at the status center and a lot of them, they're like fortresses of solitude and they, they're inward looking. And um, we take people off of the street level and we connect them up in that fortress of solitude. Um, Matt, have you been there yet? Yes, I have. OK. It's the prudential. The city of Boston will never allow this to happen again if you hear them talk, because it takes people off of the street and puts them, uh, and so it removes bodies on the street. The, the cities do not like uh, overhead pedestrian ways, they don't like mid-block crossings because it removes bodies from the sidewalks. The thing that keeps our cities vibrant and vital and commercial and, and economically uh, strong is shoppers on sidewalks in front of stores and we try not to allow this to happen. We make an exception for WGBH because um, it's more of a building, a bridge building. 
Yes, Chris. So, isn't, so what's the difference between like, like not risking the potential and being in the street? Um, in reality, um, you know, there's still plenty of you see there's still plenty of people on the street. Right. Um, but in principle, in general, um, there's a, a no no pedestrian walkway. Remember this? Panoptic. Right, the panopticon is real, and we now live in a world of surveillance. The solution models can measure the distance between your eyes, the width of your lips. This new ability to record, store, and analyze images of faces on a fast scale will fundamentally change notions of privacy, fairness, privacy. and trust. 2018, that most contact that people will have with face recognition, they won't actually know necessarily. It'll be through security services, it'll be through shops that are profiling you. And that's the more worrying side of it. But tech companies are forging okay. ahead of them. So this is, um, you can now, this was a New York Times journalist uh, tracking cell phone. Every, everybody has a tracker on them. Uh, the data is being tracked. I could take attendance if I had access to this just by whether your phone is present in the room or not. Um, or I could use, some teachers now use facial recognition software. They just put a camera and that's the way they take attendance. I'm going old, old school here. But um, this is a way of, uh, they identified um, a, a senior defense department official and his wife participated in the, um, the Women's March uh, protesting Donald Trump's uh, inauguration back in 2017. And uh, this is, uh, you can track anybody now. Um, and so this is the new surveillance regime that uh, is part of the LA school analysis of urban reality that we now live in. Any questions? Okay. Uh, if you have ideas for the analysis and you want to run them by me, uh, when's a good time to do that? Right now. Okay. Oh, I didn't expect that. Let's do that.